What is a jewelry design center? JDC is a family-owned business with deep roots in Montana. Why Montana? Because this community made us. Made us family, made us artisans, made us believe in love, made us hometown heroes. Because this community made us shine. Why Montana? Because Montana is home. We're back on the audio. We're back on the video. I know you missed seeing our beautiful faces. I wore such a nice hat last time. Yeah, too. I know. Sorry, last week, the video processing, we don't need to go through the process. It's just, you know, by the time I figured it out, it was too late. But millions of you around the world listen to the audio feed. And now we'll have millions upon millions on the audio feed and the video feed. Well, let's give them what they're here for. Yeah, go Tuesdays pack. with Tutel. <laughs> Ryan Tutel in studio with me, Coulter Nuwana. is coming to you from the ESPN MT studio as part of the Big Sky Breakdown podcast series and the Skyline Sports YouTube channel, SkylineSportsMT.com. Appreciate you for following along for all these years and uh, particularly for this 2024 uh, upcoming football season. What did uh, what'd you think of Pearl Jam? I mean – Fantastic. It was uh, awesome. Man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, you know, I mean, it's never not going to be just one of the best nights of your year, you know, when, or when just you go your life. see them. Uh, and so I I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, it, it's sort of one of those things. We're up quite a ways away. Ryan and I were in the north end zone. And the negative part of that is you genuinely can't see what's going on on stage Not so really. you rely on you have to watch the camera the folks and yeah. stuff like that and that's all cool but the good part of that is you get the full effect of mount sentinel and the m yes. up here the the body of attendees exactly. who are inside right. the building the sound was was fantastic i mean they do a great job even in what I understand is a bit of an acoustic challenge inside of Washington Grizzly to make it sound great. I thought they played great. Not that I would be uh, a tremendous critic, you know, uh, or capable of, of a critique on that. But the other thing that shocked me too is, you know, when the, when the concert was over, I was like, man, that was a great concert. I don't know how long that was though. And then I looked back at the playlist and it's like oh, 30 songs long or something. I'm like, really? We went through all of this? It seemed, you know, you could have told me they played 15 songs. I would have been like, yeah, that sounds about right. No, no, no. Nope, they were there for the whole deal. And I just, it just kind of flows, man. So, but uh, yeah, it was it was really fun. And I think it, it's a treat for us in Missoula. It's, it's fun as a Missoulian to have a band like that who obviously has Missoula ties, Missoula home, but to sit here and be like, in my town, in my place, I've seen Pearl Jam elsewhere a couple times, but in Missoula, there is something special about it as a Missoulian and as a Montanan. I certainly enjoyed it every second of my time. Great. Hey, you know, this is a real time when I got a jet out. If you wonder why I took my headset off, it's because I had to go talk to Marcus Weir, one of the best players, not only in the Big Sky Conference, but in the country. We're certainly going to get into the reason why we're giving a lot of coverage to Montana State, part of our uh, MO at Skyline Sports, but also Montana State, a huge 35 31 victory over New Mexico. We're the gonna... reason is because they're the team that played. No, that's Holster. that's also true. But I mean, the first FBS win <laughs> since 2006 for yeah. the Cats. No, no, no. We're going to get into it, but just one comment on Pearl Jam. The thing I appreciate so much about Pearl Jam, I've seen them six times now, almost, well, exclusively in the Northwest. I've seen them in Seattle, Spokane, Missoula. They're obviously from the Northwest, they love the Northwest. But you can just tell that they really just love Missoula. And I, I know they show out no matter where they're at. They probably in Belgium and Munich and wherever else, London, and they're they're showing out always. But they you can tell, man. Jeff Jeff Amet particularly, he loves Montana, man, and it's uh, it's really cool. It's it's pretty special to have such an iconic band have such a real tie to the state and to the city. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's right, and I think that um, Missoula's live music scene has increased by probably an order of a hundred from the time <laughs> when you and I were in, in middle and high school in this town. And yet it is still certainly a, um, you know, a small dot on the map when you take a look at like the, the nation. And I think a ton of bands come through here and are amazed at how much they 
how much people turn out for it and yes. how great the venues are right. and how much they love being here right. and playing here and reschedule because they like being here and come back through. For sure. Uh, but to have the direct, hey, this is actually my home in the sense of, of Jeff here in, in this town and thereby, you know, secondarily uh, the band as well in part, um, you know, that adds an element to it that, that others that you just don't have. So uh, it is, it's, it's very cool and enjoyable. And um, again, part of what makes sports great, music, all these things, the civic community togetherness of like just being out together. River City Roots is happening in, in uh, a week and a half on the streets of Missoula, and to go again and just be with everybody, be together, listening to music, having food, having drinks, doing, um, you know, being part of the culture and of the uh, uh, the vibe, the energy of the city is is glorious. It's part of what makes this place and a lot of different, a lot of places great, uh, but certainly Missoula uh, is uh, high on the list there. What was your uh, Saturday like then? How much week zero did you watch? All of it. All of it, start to finish. Florida State Man, in you, Belgium. You are an amazing, amazing uh, couch Right on sitter. through. Watched, uh, watched Jeff Choate almost coach his <laughs> la- predicted to be last place Nevada Wolfpack yep. to a victory over SMU. Point dogs only lost by four. Man, so. that was a disappointing uh, loss in a lot of ways. Well, actually, not unlike New Mexico. I mean, New Mexico and Nevada had essentially the same map for losing. Right. Both Mountain West schools, although one lost to ACC Dark Horse SMU and the other lost to FCS Power Montana State. Take that for what it's so worth. Let me, let me ask you this. In, in the post-pandemic era, that's sort of like this new age of college football, mm-hmm. 2021 through now, about four years, we've seen now five Big Sky victories over Mountain Wests in that time. Uh, and then you've seen like three more that were really, really close games, like Montana State at Wyoming a couple of years ago, for example. They lost 19-16. to 16. So you've seen sort of pretty good competition. Everyone's, you know, the Cal Polys of the world have certainly gotten blown out by Fresno State 63-10. to 10, But like most of the time when a better or good Big Sky team plays a, a middle Mountain West team or a bottom Mountain West team, it's competitive. Are the levels getting closer, or what What do we think of this football out west? Because I think someday sooner than later, we're going to see a realignment of all of this, and, and there's going to be uh, at least opportunities for these teams to be in a peer division, if not a peer conference. Um, but right now, like the fact of the matter is like Montana State was straight up better than New Mexico, even though they played terribly bad. Yeah. And New Mexico's got 22 more scholarships. So yeah. is there is it evening out a little bit, or what do we think of just the, the playing field between the Mountain West and the Big Sky? Well, I think that – I mean, it's going to always vary from year to year, but if you take the, the two or three best teams in the Big Sky, yes, they are equal, absolute equal peers with the middle third of yeah. the Mountain West. Right. And they're better than the bottom third of the Mountain West yes. every single year. This is not new. I mean, I, Idaho beat Nevada 33-6 to six last yeah. year. Yeah. So, Crushed them. So that, that's just a reality of it. So if you take the divisions as a whole, the Mountain West, they're not stacked on top of the Big Sky, if that makes sense. They're sort of next to one another, a half level up. Because the best teams in the Mountain West, historically, right, Boise State, uh, uh, comes to mind. Wyoming has been very good at other times. San Diego State has been very good at times. For sure, those teams are going to be those teams are going to beat basically all the Big Sky teams. I mean, right. generally speaking, Montana, Montana State, you're not going to Boise and winning that game. Totally, um, those teams are generally like top twenty five teams. Yeah, but that's the point. Is that these are teams that were you know big time bowl types of of teams coming out of the Mountain West, but um, the rest of the Mountain West. I mean, if we're going to compare the bottoms of a lot of leagues, you For know, sure. you're, I mean, there's not outside of, you know, SEC Big Ten. I mean, I think I think the worst teams in the Big 12s historically would struggle against the best Big Sky teams. I mean, when Kansas State was not very good, North Dakota State whooped them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, North Dakota I State mean, whooped North, them everybody. North Dakota <laughs> State whooped Iowa State, too, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, North Dakota so, State. That's what's so funny about this game with, with NDSU. I mean, the lines actually moved in favor of Colorado because I think Dion's been talking. Neon yeah. Dion's been talking enough to at least get some sort of 
of uh, hype going behind the buffs. But, man, like he said earlier, he said, throw me a bone. Like, why? Are we? It's just like the Bobby Halk line from last year. He's, Bobby said, hey, you can schedule a D2. Don't schedule the D2. Right. It's just like with Fair Colorado. State, like, yeah. don't don't schedule the FCS. You can schedule a FCS, just not that FCS. Yeah. So, yeah, well, that'll be fun. Join Town Pump's Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any Town Pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com slash rewards to register and start saving. Okay, Montana State. So they played as bad as you could play for about a quarter. Mm. Then they played well, but they had to to get back in the game, and they're still down 24-14 at halftime. I thought the second quarter they were fine, pretty mm-hmm. good, had a couple touchdown drives. Yep. And then third quarter, it goes awry again. They give up another defensive touchdown, and you're sitting here thinking, man, this team's screwed. They can't throw the ball. The wind keeps blowing. It keeps getting worse. And then – a calamity of errors combined with Tommy Mallott morphing into what he always <laughs> seems to be always what happens. He's throwing ground balls in the first quarter, and then he's throwing absolute dimes in the, the fourth quarter. So uh, where are we at, though? The Cats a huge favorite. Uh, yeah, and they won going away, yet they played terribly. Where are we at with what this means for them and their confidence level and just uh, in, in general? Uh, my view on week one in college football is every win is a great win and it does not matter how it happens for sure when you don't have uh you know preseason games to be played when it matters when this is now on your permanent record for the season you're one and oh it don't matter how it happened so the i mean if you give up two defensive sack fumble scoop and scores right the record is probably 98% the team that got them both wins, <laughs> right? Least, I mean, right? in the history of the sport. Yes. So that's, um, that is, that's obviously got to get cleaned up. And there's a lot more than that that would need to get cleaned up for Montana State. That said, if you want to talk about dominance on the ground, they were that in spades. I mean, 362 yes. yards rushing and almost eight yards of carry. And you'll, you know, people talk about the nine, 93 yard scamper by Jones, of course, but they had a bunch of 10, 15, oh, yeah. 18 yard runs I to mean, boot. S- Scotcher Humphrey did not have a 93 yard run. He still rushed for a buck 50. Right. <laughs> so, exactly. I think 141 was his final total, but still, I mean, you got two backs go over 140 yards in the, the same game. The, the two of them combined went for 307 yards. Yes. Uh, that's not not so bad. These guys are their fourth and fifth string running backs, according to what the depth chart was coming out of spring. So I thought in that respect it was it was outstanding. I thought the their ability, um, you know, they they outrushed, of course, but they also outthrew yardage wise yep. New Mexico when it was all said and done. If I'm if I had one concern uh, overall for Montana State in this game, aside from obviously the turnovers and and you know you just can't have that. It was. Even though they limited, I think it was like 167 yards passing total for the game uh, for, for, for New Mexico. Um, they didn't have a sack in this game, Montana State. And I thought, by and large, really didn't get to the quarterback very much at all. And I thought it was a, there should have been a lot more receiving yards in this game, if not for some crucial drops. Um, along the way, and just some misses on the part of New Mexico, but that were not necessarily the result of great Cats defense or hurrying the quarterback or doing that. So I thought, and again, I think it's so crazy. I mean, I I realize everybody bets everything. They put these lines out there, but you got a brand new coach in in Bronco Mendenhall. Right. Five out of five new offensive linemen. Right. For this football team for in New Mexico. T- for, New for, Mexico. for New Mexico. Yeah. And, and the Cats had a whole reshuffled offensive line. But they have new coordinators. There's all sorts of stuff that you don't. Into it. You don't. Obviously, this group of five, the offensive line for the Lobos, was a f- huge upgrade yes, right. from what they've had in the yes. past. So, you know, is it on Montana State? Is it a, a hugely improved New Mexico team that way? Maybe both. But I do think, you know, to not have a sack and really not to get after the quarterback all that much throughout the game, I think is one area where that's been a calling card of Montana State for a long time. I mean, they got dudes in the league who are quarterback 
rushing, no get after you defensive lineman edge dudes. And so I didn't see that from Montana State in this game. So that would be the one area. But you talk about resilience. You talk about, you know, looking looking a loss square in the face. You're down 17 in a fourth quarter. And you just keep doing what you do. And I thought I give, I give um, you know, um, Coach Vegan a ton of credit too. I mean, this, this drives me nuts. And I don't know how much this actually happens for football teams. But announcers say this all the time. But they're down 17 to 0 a minute into the second quarter Montana yes, State right. is. And you hear, well, it's time to give up the running game. you got to start no throwing way. the ball. And it's like, are you insane? There's three quarters left. Have you seen them, run? even in the first quarter, running the ball? They're still breaking them off. Well, that's right. If you're Montana State, you never abandon a run game. Ever. E- ever. ever. I mean, you're literally averaging 40 points per game without throwing the ball you, the last several years. And you gain more yards per play. <laughs> exactly. I mean, for sure. Tommy Mallott, 21 of 32, basically 66% completion percentage. Yeah. But only 6.7 yards per completion. They got they averaged more rushing per attempt than passing. Yep. Tuesdays, so, Tuesdays with two tail here on SkylineSportsMT.com. Probably presented in part by Town Pump. Town Pump Montana's best for more than six decades. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back. Tuesdays with Tutel here on the Big Sky Breakdown and the Skyline Sports YouTube feed. Ryan Tutel joining me, Coulter Nuanez. Ryan, one of the um, one of the most interesting parts about Montana State football over the last several years has been, well, I guess, first of all, just the story of the quarterback position because Brent Vegan has the onions to say we're going to bench our four-star recruit NC State transfer Matt McKay who just led us to a 9-2 and record but we're coming off of a loss in Missoula of the Grizz we're going to go with this freshman from Butte America and that whole saga then turned into the rise of the legend of Tommy Touchdown and all of a sudden the Cats are in the national championship game but then the following uh, I guess days after Frisco Sean Chambers transfers to Montana State and there was sort of this narrative that's a it's a dual quarterback system, but it was rather an either or system mm. because they played together like on the field a couple times early in that 2022 year, and then Tommy Mallott got hurt and Sean Chambers took over. Then Sean Chambers got hurt and Tommy Mallott was back in action, and they kind of went back and forth. It was very actually rare over the last several years that they were both available. So there was this narrative perpetuated that they ran a dual quarterback system, but in reality it was an either-or quarterback system. Yeah, and even even when they were both healthy or healthy enough to play, I think it was very clear. Tommy Mallott was the quarterback. That's correct. And then Sean Chambers was the the wildcat quarterback or right. whatever when you know when when the moment was called for. There was a lot of voices saying that Sean Chambers needs to be on the field more quarterback or otherwise Correct. because of the type of type of athlete he was. And that never ended up happening for a, a variety of reasons. But to your point, it wasn't series A, series B and back and forth you go throughout the course of a game. It it was never that it was never that ever. Uh, at Montana State, but also there is something to be said for it is now Tommy Mallott's show, period, Correct. for four straight quarters. That's where I was getting to, yeah. is that even if it wasn't a, uh, when they were both available, I made a comment uh, uh, several times, actually, that you know sometimes Tommy was looking over his shoulder. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I do think that with the way he's wired and the way he plays, he knew he could play with the reckless abandon that sort of characterizes his being as a football player Mm -hmm. because they're in good hands. Now, there's been an emphasis, and it's been talked about a ton out of the Montana State camp, about how he needs to be more cautious. He needs to take the plays when they're given to him. And they also say, hey, we're going to take a lot of the load off this guy. Both those things were true. Tommy Mallott ducked out of bounds twice on runs that I'd never seen him do that before in this game. He also carried the ball nine times for 30 yards. And it seemed to me like probably about half those were – just keepers in the zone read game, which mm-hmm. is what you do. But they were last year. They would line up in like an empty set and run quarterback power. You know, they were running like 
there's no doubt who's running the ball. Tommy him a lot. We're using him like a running back out of the Wildcat. Mm-hmm. Seems like they're they're tempering that back. So I guess two part question: What do you think of that philosophy in terms of trying to keep keep Tommy him a lot healthy? I think we both agree it's important. But secondly, I think he also saw what happens when Tommy Mallott is the guy from start to finish. He's got awful in the first quarter of that game. Yeah. He was, I mean, he threw multiple ground yeah. balls. Yeah, he did. He missed a couple blitz pickups. Granted, part of that's having your senior center out. A lot of times he's going to identify that, call mm-hmm. it out for you. Mm-hmm. But like the first fumble into a touchdown, he got sacked from the blind side. There was nobody that even touched him. And that's a protection issue, but that's also just a, a quarterback not getting the right thing Correct. issue. Right. Uh, but then he saw Tommy, oh, we're back against the wall. Okay, we're going to have two touchdown drives for a half time. Oh, we're back against the wall again. And then during the two-minute drill, he looked as good as you can look. Get mm-hmm. the ball out of his hands quick, great decision-making, poised, all that sort of stuff. So do you think that that has a chance to make him better? Certainly. I, and I also think, too, um, I mean, I, I'm going to just keep banging on this. It's the first game of the season. And even though – With two new uh, coordinators on both sides right. of the ball. That's right. And, he, you know, he's a multi-year starter. He knows yeah. the deal. But – he hadn't played a football game in eight months, man, and so you got to get out there and get the feel for what it's like when it's live, and dudes are really coming at you, and you actually can get strip sack fumbled, you know. Right. And and so I think there is a, an element of that, but I do think um, when you get into a mode where no man, it's your show. I think that is beneficial to the mindset and the protection stuff, you know, in terms of keeping him healthy. Yeah. It's a very fine line uh, because he is a guy who he is very strong. He's always been a runner. He's always been one to take on a hit. And I actually don't have a problem with Tommy Mallott taking on hits and even giving out a little bit of action, too. I mean, he's got these built for that. For sure. But you got to know when and where. And it's like, hey, if it's for nothing other than you're just going to make a statement, get out of bounds. Just right. get out of bounds. Right, right, you know what I mean? Right. Or just slide. I right. mean, even, whatever. But if it's, you know, we got to get a first down here, sure. go get it. Yeah. And he can do that. Uh, but he does have, I mean, he's been nicked up multiple Plenty. times, you know, and so, and they need him out there. They The, the, the Bobcats do need him out there. So um, I, I think that trying to keep him in a range is a good thing. There was the the sort of low hanging fruit narrative on social media that on one hand, great rally by Montana State, sort of a resurgence into the form that they held for several years. Because under Brett Vega has been pretty consistent. When the Bobcats are on the road, they like ride the roller coaster, but then they find a way to win late. Mm-hmm. Last year they rode the roller coaster and then lost games late at South Dakota State and at Idaho, and then they got just whipped in Missoula. But this showed okay, another rally. I don't think New Mexico's anywhere close to as good as either of those three teams that we just named that the Cats played on the road last year. But then there's the other low-hanging fruit narrative, though, that New Mexico just doesn't know how to win. And there was a calamity of errors on New Mexico's part. Multiple drop passes, multiple missed field goals, a turnover on downs, a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, Where do you lie, though, with the way that this influences the mentality of Montana State going forward? Heck of a lot better than losing a game like this. Yeah, of course. I, I mean, I think if you're Montana State, you uh, you get on the airplane. You don't look back. You right. know, you go, hey, you got a bunch of mistakes to clean it, up. We'll figure it out. It, it, it's a win. A win. Um, the there were two stone cold, wide open, play made, ball delivered drops that for first downs. Both of our sons could have made the catch. <laughs> I don't you know? know about my young son, but but your young son could have seven months. Um, <laughs> And look, man, guys drop footballs. That's the way it is. Yeah. But either of those balls get caught. New Mexico wins the football game. For sure. And I'd be pissed if I was New Mexico's quarterback. Their quarterback is a baller. He I played, thought he played was really good. well. Absolutely. I thought he was good. Absolutely. He played, he played really well. Um, and so, look, man, the, you don't sit here and, you know, split hairs if you're Montana State. Uh, Things happen and guys drop passes. Like that's just the way it goes, and that is part of learning how to win when you are have been you know a pretty dismal program for a long time. Like, hey, we got to make one play to win the football game. Go make it, and then a guy doesn't make it, and it's you know it just is what it is. And you leave the door open, and then it burns you. But it only burns you if the team who's losing, this case Montana State, has the gumption and the moxie to make a big play and then make another one and then make a stop. The missed field goals, dude, they had a microburst of the same level that we had in Missoula during the game. 55 mile per hour field goals. 
or 55 mile, mile per hour winds, excuse me. I'm shocked a, a field goal or extra point was made in the game. Well, so, see, see I know, thought it was, I it thought it was a, a grave coaching error on New Mexico's part, too, because the first field goal that was missed was clearly influenced by the wind. Okay, mm. you didn't know how it was going to get influenced, but then it just blows off the screen. And then you overcorrected the next but one. Then you just don't kick the next no, one. No, you don't. You don't. <laughs> you just don't I, kick I, the next I, one. I agree with you on that. So, I mean, there's a lot of things, but – I think that we have a tendency, not to, uh, we being anybody who analyzes games, be it media, be it uh, fans, be sure. it all of us. The only thing that matters is did you win or did you lose? Sports are binary in that way, and that is a good thing for a lot of people. Like It, it, it right. brings a resolution whether you like it or not. Yeah. But we have a, a, a tendency to retrospectively create a narrative around what the result was. Right. And... That's okay to do. And here's the thing. All the things about Montana State could that we've said positively about them, the, 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 the fight, the not giving up, the making the big plays, would still have been true about this team even if they lost the game because they, quote-unquote, should have lost the game because there were plays to be made for New Mexico that they didn't make, that Montana State didn't stop them. Right. So Montana State – Earned the victory and got lucky. That's both. Both of those are real things, right? And neither of them. Well, the, the earning it does, but how it happens at the end of the day doesn't matter. Now, I would care a lot more if this was week six, right? But I don't care because it's week one. <laughs> and here's the thing, too. You also create these narratives of like you forget the actual intricacies of how things happen. Mm -hmm. Montana State went. Turn the ball over on downs with five yes. minutes and yeah, 11 yeah, yeah. seconds to go in this game, maybe even four minutes and 50 seconds, something five around five minutes. Down 10 points on the road, they turn the ball over on downs. Mm -hmm. You're you're lost. That's it. 99.9% yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. of the time, no, you lost, sure. man. And you didn't lose. Right. You didn't lose. Again, you can always point to like the missed assignments and the broken tackles, whatever. Adam Jones became a star on Saturday. And, and why didn't you lose? Because you handed the ball off on your own seven-yard line. <laughs> to the guy who actually right? might be the best guy on your team, was, man. I mean, was, 22 was, miles per hour up the sidelines? I mean, Dane Oliver told me, Missoula Sentinel head coach, that that Adam Jones was the most surefire Division One player and the most talented player by a country mile that he's ever coached. And Dana Oliver's put 20 dudes in the Division One ranks over the last 10 years, maybe even more than that. Well, it's amazing that and, he can play guitar for Tool and run like that, <laughs> you know? Adam, and, Adam and, Jones has to be and, a fairly common and, name, right? And, you know, make it rain in the strip club, too, like Pac-Man. No, Adam, Adam, <laughs> Adam the Jones at Jones. Montana right. State is not doing that, I promise you. He's a very, very nice uh, boy, but uh, grown, so, man, grown man now. Yeah, he is. Either way. But Jones struggled with some injuries in high school, mm. and he also was a guy that, you know, there's a lot of three-sport athletes, but he was not playing three-sport athletes within the MHSA circles, so coaches were missing him. Mm. He's a hockey guy, mm. and he's a baseball guy. Right. Those are not high school-sanctioned sports. Yeah. If he's a basketball and a track guy, all the football coaches are seeing him because they're going to the basketball and the track games. They weren't. So he got sort of missed. I thought from day one he was going to be a real deal player. I didn't know he was going to be this real deal of a player. I mean, yeah. he he is like truly their most explosive running back, and they have a lot of really good running backs. Well, if backs. you can run that fast, you <laughs> are explosive. That's that's the definition. So will you marry me in your future? Or maybe you do it all over again. Hi, I'm Brian Toon with Jewelry Design Center, inviting you to come see the largest selection of Will You Marry Me in the state of Montana. The brightest diamonds of every shape and size, unique settings built to last, and skilled jewelers on site offering free sizing and maintenance for life because that's how long we want to be your jeweler. Jewelry Design Center in Missoula on Brooks across from the Montana Club. Definition of it. Tuesdays with Two Tail here uh, on SkylineSportsMT.com. Hey, where do you want to go next? You want to talk about some of these Thursday games? Do you want to talk about the Grizz? Where do you want to go? Yeah, I think I think we can start this in chronological order. Do a little bit of Thursday so and Thursday, then obviously get into Montana. Two big sky teams in action mm -hmm. on Thursday. Eastern Washington has a rarity for them, a week one game at home. Yeah. Usually they have to go play Washington or Oregon or whoever else because mm -hmm. of just the way that the athletic department structured. But they got Monmouth coming to town. So you expect that to be uh, at least a little bit of a favorite for uh, Eastern Washington. I think the line opened at, at Eastern three and a half. So basically the book's just giving them their home field advantage. And that's it. Yeah. 
Um, Monmouth has been an okay team. You know, they were pretty competitive when they came to Missoula in 2019, but that was in the olden days, the pre-pandemic days. So you never know how programs evolve. And then you got Sac State playing at San Jose State. That has an interesting level of, of intrigue to it, too, because Sac State beat Stanford in Andy Thompson's first game as the head coach last year. So now everybody's going to say, well, if you beat Stanford, you can definitely beat San Jose State. I don't think those two things are as connected as people maybe want to think. But what do you think about these two uh, Thursday games? Well, I think Troy Taylor's Sac State team could beat Troy Taylor's Stanford team. Right. <laughs> like if they would have taken his last season at, at Sac State and played his first <laughs> season at Stanford, I'll take the Hornets. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Um, so then by the, the – what, what do you call it? The uh, – uh, the connection between opponents, what's the, what, what, transitive properties? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, by, so by, now, by transitive properties, yes. then Sac State would kill Colorado because Stanford right. beat Colorado in some weird. Uh, and that is why they play the game. That's right. Colter. That's why transitive properties are stupid. They're in not sports. real in sports. <laughs> in pr- they in sports, certainly are. Indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, Monmouth, Eastern Washington. Again, week one, chalk it up, whatever. This is a must-win game for the Eastern Washington. Oh, it absolutely Eagles. is. You know, you you just you just have to if, have if, it. If Portland State wasn't in the league, Eastern Washington would have the hardest schedule in the entire league. But Portland State is in the league. But still, Eastern Washington has one of the hardest schedules uh, in the country. And as we talked about in in a previous episode, we don't have, we don't think they're really all that great. Period. Uh, this is. This is um, a big, big year for Aaron Best and his future as the head coach at Eastern Washington, no it question. seems to me. I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons why things have gone bad with the football team that are not necessarily football-related. They're institution-related. Yes. However, he still hasn't found a way to to – to to uh, buoy the ship, so to speak. Since Eric Perry and, graduated, they have not been. They have won a total of what seven games, eight at, games, two league, two losing records in a row. At the end of the day, you can bleed red and black. You can be an alumni. You can be from the coaching staff. You can be about Eastern all day, all, all the time. You, this is your job. You got to go win football games, and especially with the history of that team and that or that you know that school, um, it's not happening. And if it doesn't happen again, I don't see how a change isn't made. So the and and that has to start with a win in week one against an opponent that you have at home. You got to start two and zero for Eastern Washington. Yeah. You got Monmouth at home, and then you got Drake at home. Then you're at Southeastern Louisiana at Nevada against Jeff Choate. And then here's your Mont- here's your uh, Big Sky Conference schedule to open up: Montana and Cheney at Sac State, UC Davis and Cheney at Idaho, Montana State and Cheney. So you play the five best teams Fun in the league times. in a row. Good time. <laughs> so you got you got to get the first two at home here for Eastern Washington. Yeah, and then the Sac State, San Jose State, I have no opinion on and nothing to offer you. I like the San Jose State uh, aztec kind of thing, the yellow yes. uh, with the blue uh, you know, uh, mohawk there. That's pretty cool. And would there I'm, be a, I'm interested in it, but I don't know. Would there be a worse place to go to school in the country than San Jose, California? Uh, yeah, there would be. <laughs> I'm going to tell you there would be. I just but, mean in terms of like being a wash in irrelevancy of like everything oh, that's you're happening like around a you. Sport and, yeah, I mean yeah. San Jose is like I think like the 13th biggest city in America oh, it's, it's, or something it's like gigantic. that. It's gigantic. Yeah, 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 yeah. People don't really. I just drove through San Jose. Yeah. So I have now like a pretty recent like mm-hmm. picture of mm-hmm. of San Jose, and. It didn't do anything to change my opinion of San Jose. Um, it's just out there, and it's it's yeah, it's it's fine. <laughs> I guess my point, what I make, I'm not do- dogging on San Jose uh, as a, a city or whatever. I'm just saying, like, okay, Huntsville, Texas would be hard to go to school in. Yeah, Grand Forks, North Dakota, would be difficult to go to school in. Brookings, South Dakota. Some people probably think Missoula and Bozeman. I don't know, but people there know who like. It's not about knowing who you are, but like they know that there's a football team and that matters. matters. And like there's a million people in San Jose. They're like, what? No, 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 no no, care. No, (laughs) No, totally. Well, and that's kind of the California thing too. Anyways, I mean, even USC and UCLA are pulling, you know, half stadiums at best when they're not national championship caliber types of teams. And that's because there is a heck of a lot going on in California. Just like going outside. Yeah. For instance, uh, okay, so there you go, and no games Friday no in games the Big Sky, Friday, and Big Sky. All, everybody plays Saturday. That's then after correct. That. Yep. So the Grizzlies have Missouri State night game blackout in Washington Grizzly Stadium Saturday yeah, night, yeah, first yeah. game of the year. Uh, you get a 
a, a, a Missouri Valley team, but a bottom Missouri Valley team. Indeed. You ready, ready for my uh, my my little coaching tree tie that's going to blow, oh, I, your, blow I, I your mind I can't wait. Let's, let's put the transitive properties to this Well, we, we talked so uh, glowingly about Paul Petrino's tenure at Idaho last week. Right. Bobby Petrino was at Missouri State for a brief moment in time. Yeah, for, for one year. Uh, the head coach. He was there for was two. Uh, he was, well, he took the job ahead of the 2020 season. Mm-hmm. Then that got canceled. Right. They played the spring season in 21 and then the fall season in 21. Mm-hmm. Made the playoffs the fall season of 21. And then he coached in 2022 mm-hmm. there as well, and they took a job at Jimbo Fisher's staff at Texas A&M. That went bye bye real quick, but now he's back at Arkansas. I mean, of all of the circles to finish, <laughs> that was not one I had on my bingo card, and it is just, it you know, Hugh Freeze going to Liberty is on the same level of, to put it nicely, irony of <laughs> of of Bobby Petrino going back to Arkansas. It's like. So nothing that's ever happened before today <laughs> matters to anyone at these schools. <laughs> that's, that's right. I mean, it, I, it's impossible, it, it's, but it happened. It, it is. It is impossible, but it happened. That's very well said. So here, here is the where it comes full circle, though. By Petrino leaves, and Ryan Beard takes over. Ryan Beard is married to Bobby Petrino's sister. So you have another. Sort of Petrino lineage. I'm not trying to r- lump Ryan Ryan Bearded with the the both successes and controversies associated with his in laws. That would be unfair. But uh, but he's part, he's there at Thanksgiving. That's that's true. And uh, is it called Thanksgiving in the Petrino? Home? I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> Just called dinner. I, and I don't know if there's any crossover in terms of coaching style. All I know about Ryan Beard is. He did get his start as a GA at Louisville mm-hmm. under uh, these guys, and mm-hmm. then coached small school football for a really long time. Northern Michigan, are you familiar with this as a Western Michigan guy? I'm or? very familiar with Northern. Great hockey. Okay, Northern Michigan. Yeah, I, I imagine yeah. they do. Yeah. He coached yeah. there for a while, and then he was at Central Up Michigan in the uh, with Jim McElwain, which is also happens to be where Paul Petrino landed uh, when he was done at, at Idaho, mm. and now Ryan Beard has been at uh, Missouri State. The only other thing I know about Ryan Beard is that he declined to do any interviews with us this week. He doesn't do out-of-market interviews, and he didn't want to do Montana interviews because he felt it was going to be a distraction giving his family ties to the state of Montana. So, uh, Distraction to... I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure. The word distraction is among the most overused. It's not as overused as the word dynamic, which makes me want to just break glass Di- every time somebody says it. Dynamic and unique. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's a unique white wall. <laughs> Really? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> totally unique player. No, he's not. Um, speaking of being married into families, okay. Do we? Do you, you, I think you got to know this one. Tom Crean. I don't know what family he's married into. Tom Crean's wife. Okay. Tom Crean, formerly the head men's basketball coach at the uh, at Georgia um, and Indiana. Indiana, yeah. And uh, Mar- our buddy Marquette? Brian Fish. Brian yeah, Marquette and Brian Fish was on his staff a couple years after Montana State. Yep. Tom Crean's wife is the sister. Of Jim and John Harbaugh. Whoa. That's interesting. I mean, talk about a high-wired Thanksgiving for that crew, right? I mean, the level of the energy and just... And also just <laughs> awkwardness. <laughs> what's John doing? Who's like, got it better than us? If Jim, Nobody. If Jim and Tom get in an argument, what's John doing? You know, Because John's, like, by and large, the normal one. Then you got the old man, Jack, who's yeller, screamer. And then you got J- Jim, who's just... From Saturn, who, I mean, he is just a completely different cat. And Tom Crean, who gets his hair cut by the Simpsons. <laughs> I mean, that little kind of cut off like center part is wild. Oh man, We're rolling with that, totally wild. I mean, I'm the last person, okay, admittedly, who should be commenting on anybody's <laughs> style or hair or whatever. But there's some out there. I go. Two decades. We're still doing this. Okay. The Treasure State University of Montana football is a way of life. Lithia Ford has long been a proud sponsor of Grizz football. And Lithia Ford of Missoula is thrilled to have several of the best Montana football seniors driving the best trucks in Montana. 
Aspen Sound is the premier car audio and accessory shop in Montana. Aspen Sound makes sure the boys are riding in style with tinted windows and state-of-the-art stereo systems. There's always a party in Montana. Whether you're going to a concert, a wedding, or a football game, the Montana Party Bus will get you there. Skyline Sports and ESPN MT cover the big sky with more depth than anyone. Check out SkylineSportsMT.com and tune in to Nuanas now on 1029 ESPN Missoula every day. My Montana Roots and Wear Your Roots Clothing is your go-to spot for the most unique and comfortable lifestyle clothing you'll find anywhere. And get your custom t-shirts to support your favorite player. From five local businesses who love Montana, best of luck to the Grizz as they pursue another Big Sky Conference championship. This is with Tutel here uh, on the Big Sky Breakdown, probably presented by Aspen Sound. Aspen Sound has uh, the best in-vehicle audio stereo systems you can possibly get anywhere, but they also have... Awesome uh, abilities to give you an automatic car starter, window tinting, everything in between. You want to be riding in style, check out Aspen Sound. You can visit aspensound.com or check them out on Broadway in Missoula. All right, so for this Grizz night game, though, yeah. Missouri State, I actually think, is going to be – it's funny. Andrew Houghton and I talked about this yesterday on Nuanas Now, but – because it's the first game of the season and it's the first game since the national championship game loss and it's a night game and it's Labor Day weekend and all these things, every single person that I have met or that I have talked to that follows the Grizz, oh, the Grizz are going to win by 100. Mm. The Grizz are going to win by 50. I keep trying to tell them, the Grizz are a decided favorite. They're a multiple score favorite in this game, but this is a Missouri Valley football team coming to town. They were only 4-7 and seven last year, but they, they were in the playoffs – a short time ago, Springfield, Missouri is a actually giant city compared to places in this neck of the woods. I mean, it's like, I think it's the third largest city in Missouri. It's mm-hmm. bigger than Spokane for the metro area. So it's like a substantial, you know, urban population. They have 29 Division One drop down transfers on their team because you can get a different type of transfer there. So, you know, I agree. The Grizz are going to be favored and I don't expect anything but the Grizz to, to win and probably win handily. But I also think this team is going to be it's going to be a lot better than the season opener two years ago when they beat Northwestern State 47 nothing without even playing well. well. This is what I was going to say. Is is the difference between this – I think what people are doing is they're taking that sort of game. Oh, it's a non-conference patsy that's just a guaranteed win or a market win. And, of course – it should be a win and a hand a win handily by Montana, but this is not a nothing program and team in school right. coming to Missoula on Saturday night. It just isn't. Again, to your point, if you're in the Missouri Valley Conference, that's the best conference in the country. That's right. And so, even if it's they're, even they're picked to finish seventh in the conference this year, okay, right. that's fine. Guess what? If you finish in the top five, you're in the playoffs. That's right. So, they can't make the playoffs, by the way, because they're transitioning to the FBS. It's a, it's part of the bylaw. But either and, way, there's also that, that fact, there's also is, that fact though, right? Because yeah. last recruiting cycle, they used that. Hey, we mm-hmm. we're going to the FBS. Come come hang out with us. Mm-hmm. Let's let's uh, see what we can build. So in, in any case, um, I don't think that this is a, a team that you know Bobby Houck, the staff of the players, are taking with any sort of grain of salt or lightly whatsoever, or as any kind of tune up. I think they are going to be uh, very much focused on the opponent at hand come Saturday night. But I do agree with you that I think the prevailing sort of conversation about the ease with which this this is going to happen um, should be tempered a little bit. I think this is going to be a game that's worth watching, worth coming back from halftime to see what happens. So last year, Montana received a bunch of scrutiny for how they performed the first month of the season. Mm. Even though they won their first three games, it wasn't by enough in a lot of people's opinions. Like they, they, they had to kind of duke it out with Butler in the opener. Well, certainly, and there is such a thing as as playing poorly and winning. No, that's correct. Yeah, they, they had to duke it out with Butler. Then they went on the road against Utah Tech. They didn't want to show much, but they ran a pretty simplified offense. But they they throttled them. Mm-hmm. That was sort of like the the um, foreshadowing of what would come with Clifton McDowell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they had they got all they could handle, and then some with Ferris State, which is actually a phenomenal game. And I tried to tell Miller, great game. I try to tell everybody, hey, Bear State's got dogs. Like they, <laughs> they are gonna compete with Montana. Bobby, yeah. I try to tell everybody too, and still people, well, you barely beat a D two team at home. You know what's the season gonna hold? And then you have the calamity at Northern Arizona. But my question for you is: is this? We have hindsight as twenty twenty retrospectively, certainly. Mm-hmm. But when you look back at that, Montana 
certainly had not made a decision at quarterback. That was a sort of a harbinger of what was holding them back. Mm -hmm. But they also had a variety of guys playing in elevated roles for the first time. Trevin Gradney has a first-year you know, starter at corner. Ryder Meyer and Jackson Lee getting their first real big boy snaps at safety. You know, on down the line. Levi Janicaro is a full-time every-down player. Even Braxton Hill is sort of like the, the centerpiece. He'd been a good player the previous years, but like the centerpiece of the defense. But they also played everybody during those home games. Mm. Is there an element of calculation to that? And if so, because the formula it was executed so well last year, if we see the same thing this year with a bunch of guys getting on the field and the Grizz maybe slowly starting during this non-conference, does Bobby Houck get a little bit of leeway when it comes to the, the conversations in the community? Um, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I have anything like control of or insight into the conversations of the community that will happen <laughs> in a hypothetical out uh, situation. However, um, everything that Bobby Houck and the staff does is calculated. Right. So there's no such thing as, you know, outside of – well, even even with injury. Like every position, you know who's – it's not right. like they're trying to decide, oh, well, is it going to be guy A or guy B if, you know, somebody goes down. No, they know exactly what's going on. Now, sometimes a game script might dictate that we're going to sure. do something, you know, different or whatever. All that to say, the, the, the methodology of – who you're going to play and how and how many guys you're going to roll out there and see what's going on. Is it genuine in-game competition? Is it being treated like the preseason is treated in the NFL where we're going to let a lot of guys play for the sake of actually putting together a depth chart that we feel comfortable with because we don't, we genuinely don't have enough information, quote unquote, from practice to put that together? Is it just to create the mentality that they want a creative competition? Is it all of the above? I don't know. But there is, I mean, this is the thing that makes college football different, is there's an urgency to win. And even if you want to spend time trying to figure out who, you know, what the depth chart's going to look like or which guys you want to play in which roles, you can only have so much leeway to do that when you're doing it in real live games that really matter. And their, their non-conference schedule is by no means the the easiest non-conference schedule the Montana Grizzlies have ever had. I mean, no. there's a, on the road at North Dakota. I mean, that's good. That's a, that's good luck, you know. I More, know for sure. Morehead State, North West, or Western Carolina. Those are legitimate programs. Morehead State, I think, is the one outlier. But yeah, Western Carolina is a you know they're a top fifteen team. They have Cole Gonzalez is one of the top quarterbacks returning in the FCS this mm -hmm. year. So they certainly will be uh, at least a, a worthy opponent. But I guess the point is to me, you certainly can't prepare, and the, the kids cannot be preparing as if this is a live practice situation sure. in which we're going to figure out you know depth chart information you got to go out there what do we got to do to win the game and then if you're if if guys have a short leash if they're not playing well or not you know maybe they're you know it's a close competition and you, you want to try a different guy out then go ahead but you got to find a way to win how will you gauge success Saturday night for Montana? It's gonna be it's gonna be eye test for me. Yeah, um, I'm okay. So I guess where where will you be watching the most closely? Well, quarterback for sure. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I'm watching the quarterback, but I also I'm I'm also fascinated to see the offensive line. I think I think they have a chance to make huge strides just because they have a new voice in the room. Here's the thing, I'm going to refer back to the Montana State game. Okay, I said the thing that I'm concerned with, or that, that I noticed the most, if I'm going to point out something that that is maybe a weakness or didn't happen, was the particularly pressure in general, but I'll say defensive line pass rush of Montana State. They got zero sacks, but also New Mexico had a lot of time to sit back, go through progressions, you know, especially early in that game, a couple deep balls, and they didn't throw for a ton of yards, but there was not a ton of pressure ultimately. Yeah. Here's what I don't know, and I still don't know even having watched the game. How much of this is Montana State needs uh, work and to figure out whether it's schematically, personnel-wise, uh, to get a pass rush going, and how much of it is, hey, New Mexico had five brand-new offensive linemen, and maybe they're actually pretty good up front, and people don't really understand that. When I watch the Grizzlies on Saturday night, I'll be watching all everything – but I'm also going to watch Missouri State because guess what? They're going to have some pretty good players. And maybe there's a scenario in which 
the linebacking core, which I think is another question mark for Montana for, for from a depth standpoint I agree. Uh, coming into this season. How do the linebackers play? But also, how do the how do the running backs look for Missouri State? You know, is this a situation where they're not playing up to the level, or do there are there really good players both directions, and you're going to have a tug of war throughout the game? I don't know the answer to that. So I think that you have to consider the opponent and specifically the strengths of an opponent when you start assessing how well or poorly a team, you know plays uh, in it from a position to position standpoint there's it's so funny because I think that people just sort of check the boxes on the ones that are just what they think are automatics mm. is there any way Montana loses this Saturday of course I mean see I, I just don't think there is <laughs> well listen man I have a master's degree in possibility sure. So I can't think about questions like that without imagining an infinite number of scenarios. <laughs> and there's some sliver of those that end That's with true. the Grizzlies That's having true. a it's loss. True. I mean, Jacob Clark, Missouri State's quarterback, is a four-star recruit coming out of high school. I mean, yada, yada, you hear this all the time. But, like, he played in Minnesota, transferred in. Like, they got transfers across the board that are good. So maybe. I, I just think it would take a calamity of errors on Montana's part. Totally agree. But that's not what you asked me. No, you asked true. me, is there it's any true. scenario in which they could lose? And the answer is yes. It's true. There is a scenario. It's true. And and so it, it's it's that sort of thing where you you know you have a team. Maybe they get rolling early. Maybe they find something happen. Maybe there's a bad injury. You know, to the Grizzlies. You know that 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 all of a sudden maybe you lose QB one, and it turns out that QB two through four really are all four. You know, or you know, and it, and it doesn't work. So. Nobody thinks that's going to happen. I certainly don't. I expect, again, a convincing victory. I don't expect just a win. I'm just saying, if you're going to ask me if it's possible, well, yeah, it's possible. Lots of things are possible. Can't wait. Will you be there? Are you going on the road? I'm on the road. Ah, bummer. But I am watching. Yeah, well, of course. Um, that's the best part about uh, all the uh, new technology. You can here, watch anything as many times as you want. It's great. It's, it's better to be there. In um, certain ways. Here's why it's better to be there, because then you can watch it after the fact. Correct. You can only watch it in person the once, and that's the <laughs> beauty of it. You can't you can't return to it. Sure. However, if you want an analysis of the game at this point in time, thankfully the television broadcast is, is you get you get a no better fuller experience of of the whole. You don't get some of the specifics of some of the nuances that you would get when you when you're there in person. Um, but you you get you get the full the full deal when you're watching on TV. Tuesdays with Tutel presented in part by the Montana Party Bus. I had a great experience on the Party Bus before the Tyler Childers concert. They picked up about thirty of us, went on a little road trip down to the Bitter Valley and back, and then uh, got dropped off right at the show. It's pretty fun. Check out MontanaPartyBus.com. Whether you're going to a wedding, uh, Grizz or Bobcat football game, uh, concert, anything like that, Montana Party Bus. Dot God, thanks for being here, man. It's a pleasure, dude. Joy every time. There's always a party in Montana. Whether you're going to a wedding, a football game, a concert, Montana Party Bus can get you there safe and will take you anywhere in Montana. You can relax with friends in style, luxury, and safety. Plus, are Montana-based for local and regional travel within Montana borders. Montana Party Bus is great for both large and small groups with a capacity of up to 30 guests. If you want to elevate your event, call them anytime, 406-200-8096. You can also visit mtpartybus.com. Travel Anywhere in Montana in style with the Montana Party Bus.